Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him, Horatio. Okay, well, you might have seen uh, uh, images or cartoons of Hamlet uh, holding a skull, talking to uh, uh, Yorick, the skull, and uh, you've probably heard to be or not to be. Uh, there are a lot of very familiar quotes from the play Hamlet, and uh, there's just, I, I wish I could spend all day long talking about every one of them, but for this lecture I'm going to focus on uh, Act 1. Act 1 begins with two soldiers on routine guard duty. And remember, Shakespeare's plays were designed to happen uh, during the day in a space with an open to the sky uh, light. You know, the lighting is free when it comes from the sky. Uh, Shakespeare's audience needed to hear in the dialogue that this scene is taking uh, place at night, uh, on a dark night where people have difficulty recognizing each other. Uh, a cinematographer in a modern movie could just, you know, pan across, you know, uh, battlefields or use CGI to show shipwrecks and things like that, natural disasters. Shakespeare's audiences would have expected all that stuff to be handled, uh, all that stuff that was, that was impossible to stage, uh, to be handled in speeches. So, um, for all the complaints that you might feel as a 21st century person not used to uh, the amount of speeches in Shakespeare, um, uh, Shakespeare, yeah, sure, he spends a lot of time talking, but, but he, he didn't waste words. Here's an example of, of, of some really good storytelling editing. Uh, the soldiers have uh, seen a strange thing uh, the past two nights, and they've asked the young courtier Horatio, who is not a soldier, he's a member of the court, uh, to join them on the watch in case it happens again, so they can get his, you know, his advice. They're, you know, going up the command chain. Uh, the soldier Bernardo tells Horatio, sit down a while, and he launches into a ghost story, okay? And, you know, think of how in a modern slasher movie, uh, a bunch of dumb teenagers are watching a TV bulletin about the return of the kitchen utensil killer, and the TV cuts off, and some clueless guy says, I'll go down to the basement and check the fuse box. And they say, no, don't do that. And he says, oh, fine, I'll go ahead and do it. He goes down and checks the fuse box. And, you know, guess who's standing there with the, the bloody spatula? You know, it's the kitchen utensil killer. Well, in a similar way, um, uh, just as we uh, are comfortable with Bernardo telling Horatio, sit down, I'm going to tell you a ghost story. In the middle of Bernardo's ghost story, where he tells you, you know, it was late at night, and there I, you know, he's telling a great story. Interrupting the story is the very ghost that Bernardo is talking about. So, um, the ghost actually appears, and uh, we learn from dialogue that the ghost looks just like the recently deceased king, uh, dressed in battle armor, and the characters are talking about the ghost's facial expressions. And, you know, again, if this were a movie, a cinematographer could just zoom in on the, the actor's face, and we would know that he was, uh, how he was reacting. Um, uh, but the, the narration might to us seem talky, but Shakespeare's original audience would not have been able to see the subtle details that Shakespeare can convey through dialogue. Uh, they say, it is offended. See, it stalks away. Uh, so Horatio sings the praises of this dead king and wonders aloud uh, why this dead king's spirit is restless. So um, uh, Horatio tells these common soldiers uh, what's been going on in court, and he describes for the benefit of, of the audience as well that uh, the dead king had recently accepted a rash dare from the Norwegian king Fortinbras, and defeated him in a personal uh, combat, uh, just uh, therefore winning legal title to all the dead King Fortinbras's land. So we have a dead King Hamlet, and uh, uh, with, who has a son, a displaced son named Hamlet. We haven't met Hamlet yet in the play yet, but we know about that. Um, we also know that there's a dead King Fortinbras, and his displaced son, also named Fortinbras, who is gathering an army to take back his land. So, you know, that, that's a subplot that we're setting up for a little bit later. Uh, anyway, the soldiers think, well, maybe that's why the king's so restless, because of this external threat to the kingdom. Uh, Horatio seems a little less sure. Uh, he gives a long list of weird things that have been happening lately, uh, things that Hollywood would be able to depict with CGI, but with Shakespeare creates with words. And here, this is what Horatio says. 
In the most high and palmy state of Rome, a little ere the mightiest Julius fell, the graves stood tenantless, and the sheeted dead did squeak and gibber in the Roman streets, as stars with trains of fire and dews of blood. Even the like precurse of feared events, as harbingers preceding still the fates and prologue to the omen coming on, have heaven and earth together demonstrated unto our climatures and countrymen. So uh, Horatio narrates these creepy things, the gibbering dead leave their graves and walking the earth. Um, Horatio says that's happening to us too. Uh, Horatio refers to stuff that happened in ancient times, and he says, well, because that stuff is happening now, I'm inclined to believe I really did see a ghost, even though initially Horatio says, tush, uh, twill not come. He's, he's saying, nah, poo-poo. He poo-poos the idea of a ghost. Uh, but he's, he's, a, uh, he's a believer now that he, uh, based on uh, what he's observed, he figures this fits in with his understanding of what's happening in Denmark. So while scene one had the soldiers uh, speaking in short bursts, uh, overlapping and questioning, questioning each other, scene two opens with uh, king, the new king Claudius uh, speechifying. He's confirming recent uh, historical events that the ghost mentioned, uh, that uh, his brother has recently died, he's married his sister-in-law, and they are commemorating both events with mirth in funeral and with dirge in marriage. Okay? Um, Claudius uh, notes the outside threat of young Fortinbras. Uh, it's a subplot, which, by the way, the whole Fortinbras subplot is often cut in production, simply because the, the entire text of Hamlet would take about four hours to perform if you don't make any cuts. Uh, so anyway, the, the, whole, the whole subplot of Fortinbras is often cut, just to save, save time in, in professional productions. Um, uh, but anyway, Claudius has a brief conversation with Laertes, a, a young lord who had come home for the coronation and uh, now wants permission to leave for France. And Claudius says, well, did you ask your dad, uh, Polonius? And um, uh, uh, Claudius, is, uh, Claudius is, is not, you know, twirling his mustache and cackling. I mean, I've told you in the plot that this king, Claudius, has murdered his brother, uh, but uh, uh, Hamlet doesn't know this yet. And nobody in the world of the play knows it. The ghost has shown up, and the ghost will, coming up, tell all this to Hamlet, but he has not yet. We are seeing Claudius as a perfectly good ruler, and Hamlet is sitting there in black. He's like kind of subtweeting under his breath while Claudius is, is speechifying. Hamlet's wearing black to his mother's wedding feast. Um, he's, you know, kind of an emo jerk about it. Um, uh, the king says, now my cousin Hamlet and my son, Hamlet, aside, a little more than kin and less than kind. That aside means, he's muttering under his breath, basically. Uh, he has to speak at full volume so everybody in the theater can hear it, but the convention is nobody else on stage hears that. Um, when the king calls a Hamlet, a cousin Hamlet and my son, that reminds Hamlet that this man is both his uncle and now his stepfather, and he objects to the closeness of those connections. Uh, and he uses the word uh, kind. It's very layered. Uh, on one level, Hamlet is saying his, his uncle slash stepfather is not being kind, you know, it's not being nice. Um, but there's also um, the, the, the meaning of, you know, um, uh, uh, humankind, uh, kindred. Um, it's a family relationship, dealing with, with the nature of a thing. If he says, you're less than kind, he's basically saying, you're not good enough for my mother. You're trash. You, you don't, you're not worthy of my mother or, or of the throne. Um, the king says, uh, how is it that the clouds still hang on you? And Hamlet says, not so, my lord. I am too much in the sun. Ha, ha, ha. See, this is the joke. Uh, 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 in his own way, the king has said, uh, you know, your clouds hang on you. Why is there a little dark rain cloud over you, Hamlet? And Hamlet says, eh, there's too much sun around here. Um, it's a pun on the word sun in the sky and the fact that Hamlet is thinking of his dead father. So, um... Uh, the queen then says, Good Hamlet, cast thy knighted color off, and let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. And here, when Gertrude refers to Denmark, um, there's got to be a little dig. The word here, in this case, Denmark, means the king of Denmark. Uh, she's referring to her new husband by the title that Hamlet's father used to have. And Hamlet is, 
the, he's, he's about 30. We will understand later in the story, we learn he's about 30. Um, uh, why is it that Hamlet hasn't inherited the throne? Uh, instead of the throne passing from Hamlet Sr. down to Hamlet Jr., uh, the throne, the title of the throne, the uh, title of king seems to stay with Gertrude. It stays with the person that she married. Um, uh, Hamlet never really talks about this, but here the queen is using the official term Denmark. They are in the country of Denmark. Uh, it's, it's like in America we will refer to the White House to mean the president. Um, uh, 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 she's probably really rubbing it in to Hamlet now that, that her husband is now the king, and Hamlet owes the new king his loyalty, which he's choosing to withhold. Uh, in this situation, Claudius actually has kind of a, a calming speech. It, it's in a fittingly evuncular speech, evuncular, in the manner of an uncle. That's what evun evuncular means. Um, Tis sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these mourning duties to your father. But you must know your father lost a father. That father lost, lost his. And the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. But to persevere in obstinate condolement is a course of impious stubbornness. Tis unmanly grief. Claudius is right. Uh, in the culture of Shakespeare's time, this is good advice. Uh, Claudius is saying other people have lost their fathers. You know, work through it, get over it. He's, he's uh, uh, telling them, move on. Um, now, uh, I'll take a moment to note that Shakespeare had never heard of the five stages of grieving. Um, so a paper that uses what you learned in your Psych 101 class to analyze Hamlet as if Hamlet is a real person with psychoses that, and neuroses that can be diagnosed and with treatments that can be prescribed, um, uh, th that paper won't demonstrate your ability to do literary analysis. Um, Shakespeare was such a good observer of human nature that he created, in words, uh, such a complex and realistic representation of a depressed, grief-stricken uh, intellectual like Hamlet that that representation holds up to our critical scrutiny 400 years later when we have a completely different set of tools to understand how the human mind works. So, as an English professor teaching a Shakespeare class, I, I'm just not all that interested in how you would diagnose and treat Hamlet. Uh, any more than your psych professor who asked for a lab report would want you to, to hop up on a chair and start recycling to be or not to be. You know, it, it might be a really good recitation, uh, but it's a different genre, uh, it's a different thing that we're asking for. Okay, back to Hamlet. We uh, get our first really deep glimpse into his interior life after Claudius has finishes this pep talk, and Hamlet delivers the soliloquy that starts, Oh, that this tutu sullied flesh would melt. Um, a soliloquy, a solo, uh, by yourself. Uh, words like loquacious or dialogue have the same root as soliloquy. A soliloquy is a speech delivered on stage when you're the only person on stage, and the convention is you're really hearing their internal thoughts. It's how Shakespeare's audience would have done a voiceover kind of flashback kind of thing. Anyway, um, a soliloquy represents uh, a person's internal thoughts. Uh, and now this tutu sullied flesh soliloquy is not as famous as his to be or not to be speech that comes later, but anyway, in this first soliloquy, Hamlet expresses a wish that God hadn't uh, banned suicide. So, you know, Pretty dark thinking here. Uh, he says Claudius is not um, as good a man as his dead father, and he says he's disgusted that his mother would rush into his arms and into his bed so quickly. Uh, when Horatio shows up, he very carefully says of Hamlet's father, I think I saw him yesternight. And he briefly describes the ghost encounter, and Hamlet says he'll join them on the walls tonight to see if the ghost returns. The next scene develops the subplot. Uh, Laertes, the good son who had earlier asked uh, Claudius' permission to return to France, uh, Laertes is now preparing to leave. And his sister Ophelia is um, uh, bidding him farewell. Uh, Laertes gives her some brotherly advice, warning her not to fall for Hamlet. Um, uh, he was toying with her, you, he says. And uh, from what we've seen of Hamlet, Hamlet doesn't really seem to be the flirty type. 
Um, but this dialogue, uh, Laertes is giving us a hint of what Hamlet might have been like before he was traumatized by his father's death and his mother's remarriage and he decided to become, you know, got all emo. Uh, but what's important in this particular scene is that Ophelia um, kind of, uh, she doesn't meekly follow her brother's advice, but she doesn't reject it. She kind of, she kind of turns it around on him and warns him not to be hypocritical. Um, I shall the effect of this good lesson keep as watchman to my heart. But, good my brother, do not, as some ungracious pastors do, show me the steep and thorny way to heaven, whilst, like a puffed and reckless libertine, himself the primrose path of dalliance treads, and wrecks not his own reed. Okay, Rex, not his own Reed. Rec, uh, I reckon, uh, recognize. Um, uh, Reed is the same, same, there, the R, it's spelled R-E-D-E, -E, same as reading. Uh, you know, don't hold me to a rule that you yourself don't intend to follow. That's, that's Rex, wrecking not your own Reed. Uh, Ophelia is not meekly accepting her brother's advice. Uh, she's not uh, rejecting it either. She's just insisting, well, dear brother, if you expect me to behave, then you should behave too. Um, what we see here is kind of some healthy sibling banter. Uh, she's talking her mind, and she's knocking him down a peg or two. And uh, Shakespeare does it, I think, because he wants us to like these people. It, it's a healthy, warm relationship. Um, uh, into this charming little family scene comes Polonius, who's not a bad guy, but he is a type of the pantaloon. That's the, you know, a, a, a foolish old man um, who's overprotective of his daughter, uh, serving as a comic obstacle to the union of the young lovers. That's the pantaloon. Um, now I've seen a production of Hamlet that has Laertes, like, like, you know, like on his horse, or at least, you know, standing, you know, with a saddle, like, ready to ride off. And uh, uh, he's kind of annoyed that Ophelia has um, uh, kept him around long enough for Polonius to catch up and give him this talk. And while Polonius is giving all this speech, the, the, the two siblings are, like, making faces behind his head, and when one of them <coughs> snickers, uh, Polonius thinks that that person is laughing at him and scolds that person. That makes the other sibling laugh even more. And it's just, you know, it was, it was understated, but uh, the actors were having so much fun you know, you know, stop touching me, I'm not touching me, you know, like siblings having fun together, um, uh, that, um, uh, again, I think we, we're really supposed to like Laertes and Ophelia. Um, now, let's talk about this advice that Polonius gives. Um, you may have heard, uh, uh, some, this, some of these are famous quotes, uh, neither a borrower nor a lender be, uh, this above all to thine own self be true. You may have seen quotes or versions of those ascribed to Shakespeare, to thine own self be true. Well, but Shakespeare put them in the mouth of this doddering old fool. Um, our, our modern world really values privacy and independence and, and, and individual thought a heck of a lot more than Shakespeare's world did, when people depended on each other. Uh, so this advice from Polonius, uh, don't ask people for help. Don't help them if you could help them by loaning them something. Don't do that. Be true to yourself instead of um, uh, being true to the community. Uh, I think Shakespeare's, uh, you know, to us, this may just seem like, like the whole play is full of old-timey advice from old-timey people. But I think Shakespeare's audience would have recognized the significant difference between the advice that Laertes and Ophelia are giving to each other and the really antisocial advice that Polonius is here giving. Shakespeare, however, has Claudius and Gertrude work together uh, to offer Hamlet some pretty sound advice. Meanwhile, Laertes is doing everything right, and Ophelia is sisterly enough that she lets her brother fuss over her, but she also fusses over her brother. Um, uh, these, are, these are loving siblings that are getting some comically awful advice from their father. Okay, scene four, back on the castle walls. Uh, we have a conversation about how cold the air is. A camera couldn't just show, you know, uh, misty breath coming out of their mouths. Uh, Hamlet asks what time it is so that when he gets an answer, the audience will learn it's after midnight. Uh, it's near the time the ghost usually appears. We learn the king is up late tonight partying and drinking and dancing. And Hamlet says that's a tradition more honored in the breach than in the observance meaning that it would be more honorable to give up this tradition than to participate in it. In Shakespeare's time, 
the Denmark, the Scandinavian countries were thought of as a place for drunken partiers. Uh, and here Hamlet is taking on a very, you know, an English point of view. Uh, uh, he is uh, from Denmark, so he's part of the same culture, but he's um, criticizing the stereotypical ways that the Scandinavians are perceived as being different from Englishmen. So I think Shakespeare is doing this to make his audience identify with Hamlet, because Hamlet is presenting a point of view that would align with Elizabethan culture. Um, uh, this speech is not the climax of a scene. It's, it's not the moral of the play. It's in, it's in fact quickly interrupted by the arrival of, you know who, the ghost. Uh, when Hamlet says he wants to follow the ghost, um, the others try to hold him back, and Hamlet here shows some kind of dark, some kind of manly wit when he says, By heaven I'll make a ghost of him that lets me. Uh, and you might think he's saying in a, it let in the sense of that lets me go, but... Um, you know, as it happens, if you use the lookup feature in uh, Google Chrome, you'll find that let has an archaic meaning that is the exact opposite of what we're thinking of. It would clarify that Hamlet here is not threatening anyone who lets him go, but he's actually preventing anyone who keeps him from going. That's what let means in this case. We waited for quite some time for the ghost to speak, and he does speak. The crucial bit of information the ghost imparts, and you already know it because I gave you spoilers in the plot, is, uh, and it's something that uh, audiences familiar with the legend probably would also have known. Uh, but here we see Hamlet learning it for the first time. It's that Hamlet Sr. was murdered by the current king, uh, Claudius, and his spirit is walking the earth so that his son will avenge his death. Up to now, we've seen Claudius in mostly a positive light, uh, approving of the good behavior of Laertes and giving Hamlet what seems like reasonable advice, um, you know, just being a governor. Uh, but the ghost here gives us crucial new information. Um, uh, the ghost tells us the official story, which is that a serpent killed the king when he was in the garden. Uh, the ghost says that story is not true. And he says the ears of the people of the kingdom who've heard that false report are being rankly abused. Um, uh, the whole ear of Denmark is by a forged process of my death rankly abused. Uh, now, the fact that this king dies in the garden from a serpent bite, of course, suggests the story of, of Adam and Eve in, in the garden of Eden, uh, uh, and, uh, and also the story that the ghost says really happened, that one brother killed the other, that reminds us of the story of Cain and Abel. Um, but Shakespeare is doing a lot more than simply reminding us of Sunday, Sunday school stories. Um, without looking up a modern paraphrase, I would like you to try something. Um, Take a look at this passage. Note, I've already said that Claudius gives good speeches. Uh, we've already seen him flattering Laertes. We've seen him giving a, a, a speech welcoming his guests, uh, deferring to Laertes' his father. We see him sending a tough guy message to the foreign king, uh, Fortinbras. Um, we see him united with his wife, uh, the queen, and trying to talk some sense into Hamlet. Uh, now, where Hamlet is kind of whiny in public, and so far, he's given his best speech in, in private. Uh, we see Claudius is really a master speaker. So how exactly do we learn that Claudius killed Hamlet? That is, what was the method that Claudius used to kill Hamlet, uh, Hamlet Sr., and why is that significant? Maybe you'll see what I'm getting at, and maybe when you look at all this, you'll see something completely different. Um, the point is not that I want you to find exactly what I found, but I'm, I'm coming short of connecting all these dots for you because I want you to do it. Uh, I want you to practice spotting details and patterns. Um, the point is not that you find exactly the pattern that I, that I found, but I, I want you to find something. Let's see what happens here. Um, so I've called your attention just some dots, and I'm asking you to connect them. Take that next step. Uh, I'm not asking you to listen to me tell you the correct answer so you can spit it back on a quiz. I want to see what happens. So, um, uh, and there are certainly many other pieces that uh, you may notice on your own while you're reading this, and there are many other patterns to find. There's not one particular correct answer that I'm looking at, but uh, I've, you know, kind of dumped a couple pieces in your lap, and uh, I'd like to see what you do with it. So, um, uh, I look forward to hearing your responses as you work through Hamlet. Uh, it's a challenging play. Uh, I'm always excited to teach it. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say about it. Let me know if you've read Hamlet before, if you've seen a production. Uh, there was a professional production a couple of years ago that I saw here. It was very good uh, in uh, Pittsburgh. And um, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, 
I always like the discussion in this class, and I'm looking forward to this one too.